Well, folks, we have drama, drama, drama back in the stock market now. Oh, yeah, baby. It's getting fun. We got drama right before earnings season about to kick off. Literally, earnings season kicks off uh, pretty much tomorrow and into Friday. And then next week and the next uh, few weeks after that, we get the gauntlet of earnings coming. And here we are in this incredible situation with the Federal Reserve. What are they going to do? Hot CPI, hot inflation numbers, commodities are running. Everybody's starting to be like, Uh Uh-oh, okay. Wall Street's on the verge of panicking. I want to talk to you guys about that and how to make sure you guys don't panic out there. And uh, I want to react to this first part of Fast Money here from Fast Money Show because they brought a lot of interesting perspectives that I want to share my opinions and perspectives on in this one, okay? So before we get into all that, I just want to talk to the audience out there, right? How do you make sure you don't panic? Uh, because Wall Street's going to freak out over some things that are about to happen here. And I want to just kind of talk to you guys about these things. And so you understand what's happening and also how to position yourself so you don't freak out in your calm, cool, collect it, and you know how to react in these situations. By the way, appreciate you guys for joining me. I'll ask in return, smash a thumbs up, and make sure you subscribe to this channel if you're not already, okay? So what's going to transpire now? Super hot CPI. We're going to get all into the nitty-gritty details around that, right? And... This leads people to believe there's likely not going to be a recession, at least in the next six months, right? A year from now, two years from now, three years from now, it could be a different situation. But likely, you know, no recession probably in the next six months. So that kind of takes that out of the camp. But now the fear starts creeping in of, oh, my gosh, could the Fed keep rates high this entire year? What are the ramifications of that? Could the Fed go higher? What if CPI continues to go higher, right? So Wall Street's going to have this kind of moment here for a bit of kind of worrying and like what's going to happen here. And if you could have a few companies report weak earnings, then everybody's going to start worrying about not only potential rate hikes, right, if CPI keeps coming in hot, commodities coming hot, but then they start worrying about stagflation if you had some weak earnings, which is a whole new risk out there. So all of a sudden you have people worrying about stagflation, well, people could also be worrying about inflation, right? And what's the Fed do in that sort of situation, right? So how do you make sure you don't freak out in this situation? You act appropriately, right? So is the answer selling out of all your stocks, right? The answer is no. That's not the answer. Is the answer going all in the market, maxed out? No, that's not the answer either, right? It's somewhere in between. You want to make sure you're obviously always heavily invested in the market. We know the, the saying, don't time the market, right? And the reason that's such a famous saying is because it usually pays to not try to time the market, right? In terms of planning on when the market's going to drop, then I'm going to get back in. It's usually a lost cause. It's usually not worth your time and attention. You're usually going to end up in a worse situation than when you went in, which is very unfortunate, right? So that's not the right game to play. You want to be invested. This is how I position. It doesn't, whatever happens here, it really doesn't matter to me in the end. Inflation is too hot. Okay, recession, stagflation, whatever, I'm set up for it. How am I set up for it? I'm heavily invested in the greatest companies in the world, right? Many of my biggest investments are the strongest of the strongest companies in the world. You want to be in those sorts of companies. Most of my companies trade at very fair valuations, especially if you look at many of my biggest investments, extremely fair valuations. So it's not like we're going in with some crazy, like, I don't understand how it trades at that valuation type moment, right? So you want to make sure you're invested into high quality companies that trade at very fair valuations. And you want to be in the type of companies that are going to grow regardless. If inflation happens, they grow. If recession happens, they grow. If stagflation happens, they grow. If everything's fine, just everything's much more expensive, they grow. Like, like those are sorts of companies you want to be in, right? And that's how I like to think. If you're more sophisticated in the market, you can have a few hedges on for your portfolio as well. So you're set up. So even if there's a downside event, I make money off that. Literally, if the market, if the NASDAQ tank 10% the next month, I'm clapping. I'm cheering for that. Why am I cheering for that? Even though you might say, well, Meta's going to go down a lot. Tesla's going to go down. NVIDIA's going to go down. Shopify, Amazon, right? The reason I'd be cheering for that is, one, I can buy stocks for a lot cheaper. If the NASDAQ was 10% cheaper, I can buy stocks for a lot cheaper. Two, my SQQQ hedge is going to make me a bunch of money and some of my other hedges as well. So then I'd be able to take pretty, you know, massive profits out of those and go ahead and buy stocks with that money, right? Or rehedge if I needed to do that at that particular time. So that doesn't scare me. And that's how you position the market and always keep some cash around. Put yourself in a situation that if stocks drop, you got some cash around, you're ready to buy. Like, okay, if they want to send the NASDAQ down 10%, okay, sweet. Uh, I'll, I'll gladly take some shares off their hands, right? 
playing the long game, not the short game, because all this short-term stuff, it all comes and goes. Hot CPI, good CPI, ooh, so-so CPI, all these numbers, they come and go, right? Uh, unemployment rate, 3.9, 4.9. 2.9, whatever. It all comes and goes in the end, right? You just got to focus on the long term in this game. And just remember the name of the game. The name of the game is what? It's getting bigger and bigger ownership stake in great companies, right? That's the name of the game. If you need help understanding all this stuff very in depth, my Become a Master Stock Market course is my number one course ever. Pin comment down there, folks. We are now only four days away from the massive sale. It's a uh, yeah, it's a pretty epic sale coming up here. Sixty nine dollars for that tier. It's usually one hundred twenty five dollars. Get access to that. See the moves I'm making each week. How I diversify my funds around, and then get part of that Discord chat of like minded investors. There'll be pin comment down there. Let's get into this. So we are contestants favorite live in the Nasdaq market site in the heart of New York City's Times Square. This is Fast Money. Here's what's on tap tonight: rate shock, yields jumping on the back of the hotter than expected inflation data. The ten-year back above four point five percent. The two-year closing in on a five handle. And today's move signaling the Fed will rethink rate cuts for the rest of the year. We'll debate that. Plus, all the ripple effects from the bump in the bonds, the real estate ripple? sector taking it on the chin, small caps struggling to find their footing. We'll go inside the numbers coming up. And later, the options action in the regional banks, new private company ETF taking Wall Street by storm and bucking the trend. Stock moves catching our traders' eyes in today's volatile market. I'm Melissa Lee, coming to you live from Studio B at the NASDAQ on the desk tonight. Tim Seymour, Karen Feinerman, Dan Nathan, and Guy Adami. We start off with the major market moves after the yet Wall another Street hot is. inflation report. The yield on two-year Treasury is spiking towards the 5% mark for the first time since last November. Uh, 22 basis point move today. That was the biggest since March of last year. Stocks, meantime, solidly in the red, though off the lows of the day. The Dow shedding more than 420 points. It's seventh day of losses in the last eight sessions. It is now down over 3.5% from the record hit, hit just last month. And take a look at the drops in some of the most rate-sensitive sectors. Regional banks think... By the way, in terms of the price action today, I'm shocked. I'm actually shocked. I'll be honest with you guys, okay? What am I shocked about? I'm shocked that the Dow wasn't down 800 plus today. Considering how hot that CPI came out, I'm surprised it wasn't down a lot more. Being that it wasn't down a lot more means people are very, very comfortable in this market at the moment, right? There could be some panic coming here very soon, but they haven't kind of woken up to that quite yet. They're not quite ready for that panic yet, they're getting close, though, right? And so today's move was just kind of like a little rumbling, uh, maybe before the, the earthquake hits, right? Then 5%, their worst day since January. Builders dropping below their 50-day moving average for the first time since November. And small caps now negative once again for the year. All this, as the latest CPI report showed, consumer prices rose 3.5% from a year ago, the third straight month of higher-than-expected results. That print seemed to squash hopes for a Fed rate cut anytime soon. Chances of a cut in June? Plunging from nearly 60% before the report to 17% now. Oof. And the probability of no cuts at all this year went from just 2% to 13% now. Surprised We've been talking about the stickiness of inflation for some Surprised time. Like what this could mean 30%. for the Fed. Guy, you especially have been uh, on this. Well, we're seeing it manifest itself in a lot of different things now. And when you're talking about 10-year yields now, closer to the recent highs now after today than the recent lows of 3.8 percent which should be somewhat disconcerting i think and when you see moves of this magnitude i mean that is alarming and tim's been talking about this as well i you know i still think yields continue to go higher from here maybe today was the day where the market finally woke up to the fact that yields going higher is not for a good thing but amongst the many things that stuck out to me today look at the volatility in the volatility index today i mean it was not just a straight line up and stay there this was a lower than north of 16 and a half below 15 and a half i mean volatility is volatile again which i think also should be somewhat alarming to people out there so we talked about it yesterday a lot about all right what if it comes in a little hot which it came in a little hot right. this is sort of not it's it's sort of the price action you would expect to have it did feel like a little bit more scary a little bit. This, you know, going down for 422 points is actually not that big of a deal if you step back and look how far it's come. It's just the question of, oh, wow, is it really so? We're not going to get so many rate cuts this year, which we've been talking about for a long time, seemed 
kind of absurd. We're at the start with six, and now, I don't know, are we at two, one? I don't know where we are now. Somewhere in between that, I think. But um, interesting to me, I, I like the IWM. I thought we brought it out. That did not happen. Surprising to me, though, the Magnificent Four, Seven, whatever you want to call it, did pretty well today, right? Most of them in the green or very slightly in the red. And that was sort of surprising to me. Uh, to me, that should not be surprising. The fact that I think NVIDIA was up today, I believe Meta was up today, that, that should come as no surprise. And here's why. Those companies are what? Loaded with cash, and those companies usually have no debts. Those big dog type tech companies, right? Or if they do, it's a very minuscule amount compared to how much cash they have. Higher for longer means these companies are going to be able to rake in tremendous amounts of, of interest income for you know, at least the rest of this year, right? And probably into next year at some point in time while their interest expense is non-existent because they don't really hold debt. So it's pretty much the best situation. And we know those companies are going to put up great numbers regardless. So for them, this is actually a good thing. And then on top of that, you have people maybe rotate some money on a day like today out of the small caps, out of the regional banks, all those sorts of things. And where are they going to rotate it? They don't want to just put it to the sideline because there's already so much money on the sideline. They want to put it to the big techs, right? You want to put it into Meta, you want to put it into NVIDIA, those sorts of stocks. And so that's exactly what we obviously saw play out today. So it doesn't surprise me at all. And, and Amazon was even green today. I don't know if it finished green, but it was green earlier. That would be a place that people would yeah, still feel comfortable 0.3%. as opposed to, oh, wow, I've made so Nothing. much money in this space. Here's a little, you know, warning shot. Maybe I should sell some. That didn't happen. And, and you know who is actually hurt the worst out of the whole MAG7, right? Which MAG7 is Apple, Google, McDougal. Tesla, Meta, Amazon, Microsoft. Who's hurt the most out of higher for longer? Okay. You might think Tesla and no doubt a little, at least a little bit, but no, that's not the right answer. The right answer, Apple. Apple's the one that's most hurt by higher for longer because higher for longer puts a recession risk out there, right? Which that could obviously hurt Apple at some point in time if that recession risk comes true. Right, I keep the rates at a high level. They're the most consumer hit. On top of that, the other guys have minuscule or no debt. Apple has a substantial amount of debt. Because they've done so many share buybacks over the years, Apple sits on a great amount of debt. I believe Apple's probably sitting on somewhere between $80 billion and $100 billion of debt right now, um, from at least last I checked. So when you think about it from that context, that's not great. Now, they do have a ton of cash. They're making money off treasuries, but they're not being helped as much as some of these other companies in regards to that net interest income versus net interest expense. But this, this is data that shows the economy is still good. Yeah. They, we're, that we're still roaring. And wasn't that sort of the argument behind, you know, if we get hot numbers, it actually shows that we're in a pretty good place, that we can actually continue to grow even with this sort of restrictive territory that the Fed says we're in? I think we can. And, and I'm not surprised that, that the mega cap techs, those that aren't wounded in some way, but the ones that, that, you know, the three or four that are that are left are moving higher in a higher rate environment because mm -hmm. they have the earnings power. So according to this website here, it looks like uh, Apple has around $108 billion of debt. So over $100 billion of debt for Apple. Are uh, this certainly less tied to inflation. Um, the dynamic of where, yes, core services were the culprit today on that CPI number. Um, what that means is it's not one, it's not two, it's now three CPIs. And, and so the jury is, is certainly... Um, you know, not out at all. I mean, it's very clear what's going on. I think we know that the Fed has to be on hold. It's probably September. There's different ways you can be kind of starting to game this. Um, but I, I look at other things that are also good and bad for the economy. The fact that energy is higher, the fact that commodities are generally higher, um, these are things that are probably not helping the Fed. Ultimately, they may not be helping the consumer. And, and I think the view here is that a little bit uh, of, of a headwind into financial conditions is probably good news for the Fed. Um, no matter what happens here is if we start to see the stock market sell off and we start to get a little bit more inflation around us, um, I think you're going to see the impact that actually have on rates. I think rates will go higher. I think they could start to go lower before bucks. they then Dang. go higher. But that's that's probably, you know, I'm playing three, six month tactical game here. I mean, I think uh, right now it does feel like rates can hold this level. Remember, the high of rates was about 5% in 
mid-October. Think of the move that the market had as rates came down. I think we've all said equities probably wake up one day, and we don't know what that day it is, but we said a week ago that VIX, we talked about that day, you shot up over 15, and I think volatility is now in the hands of the market. It's funny. I've said this a few times over the last couple months. I mean, what's going on in the markets and across risk assets in general feels a lot like late 2021. This is the period when the Fed said basically do battle inflation. They're going to raise interest rates. They telegraph what they were going to do. We go into 2022, and they take Fed funds from basically five, you know, a half a base, or a half a percent uh, to four and a half percent and we have a stock market that fairly orderly sells off let's say 20 percent or so last year when folks start pricing in the fact that basically they're pretty much done they did get from four and a half to the upper band at five and a half percent we're kind of off to the races here there was some additional liquidity that was added to the markets during the regional banking crisis which was actually caused by the rise in interest rates right so i bring it back to where we are right now a lot of things feel kind of similar in, in many ways to me. And it was the last bastion, you just mentioned this Fab Four, that actually saw money flows into them today. They were green on this sort of day. And so that reminds me a little bit of late 2021. So I say to myself, if the next move is pricing out rate cuts and then possibly raising rates, that just can't be good for equities, in my opinion. Ones that have really just acted, um, you know, like in a pretty reasonable sort of manner this whole period. So at some point, there's going to be something that happens that causes people to sell everything all at once. Mm -hmm. You know, the dollar today, we saw that, what was going on. We saw what was going on with yield. Gold wasn't even down a whole heck of a lot. Crude hangs in there. And I say to myself, okay, if this is all predicated on the fact that today's number, Friday's number, it says that the economy, like you just said, is okay. Well, sooner or later, the long and variable, lab, or variable, variable lags of interest rates going higher should kind of affect the economy. And thus, you know, maybe, you know, these multinationals are not going to have the sort of margin, you know, that they have had. And that's going to be a pressure on S&P 500 earnings. At some point, you discount that. I don't know. The backdrop, though, to this time around in terms of interest rates where they are is that the consumer is a lot weaker. So what he just described there, you know, my opinion is no doubt at some point that will play out. But getting the timing right of that is brutal. Is it 2024? Probably not. Is it 2025? Oh, maybe. Is it 2026? Maybe 2027? That's the, that's the part. What he laid out, uh, yeah, it's going to happen. But the timing... Than before, I mean, right. right now, households have spent down all their pandemic savings. They've taken on credit card debt. Credit card debt, the rates on credit cards are now at record highs. So they could really be facing difficulty, particularly when you're talking about higher. We talked yesterday about electricity prices. The average bill year on year has gone up two to three. It's only two to three percent of household spending. Gasoline is only 3% of household spending. But that's the bill that consumers open up and say, I'm paying more. And then you add to this auto insurance, which is up 22% in the CPI report. I mean, all these things hurt, even just psychologically, they hurt. So the consumer is combating inflation, which we've established as a problem, with credit, which is a probably <laughs> as big a problem. And I don't know how that particularly ends, but in terms of the inflation story, I mean, Jeff Curry is a legend in our world. He was at Goldman Sachs for two decades. He's the Carlisle Group now. He was on Squawk Box this morning. And he says, you know, if it was just a couple of commodities, I wouldn't be that concerned. But he talked about it being across a swath of different commodities, soft commodities, industrial metals, obviously, precious metals and energy. And he's concerned by it as well. So GSC, it's there. Baby. The fact that people are still thinking that rate cuts somehow make sense to me or that six in the first place made any sense was preposterous. Now I think the market's starting to figure out, wait a second, maybe rate hikes is something we should have a conversation about. For more on inflation and what the Fed that's, minutes out today revealed about the likelihood of rate cuts, whether or not there could be a rate hike in the cards. Let's bring in CNBC senior economics reporter Steve Leesman. Steve, always great to have you with us. If um, there you know, starts to become a lot of fear about rate hikes, that's when pure panic starts on Wall Street. If people start really discussing that and that becomes a big subject and that's like seen as something that could potentially happen, people people will sell just on the, the – if, if a discussion becomes not just a discussion but like serious, like, oh, I think the Fed's probably going to you know, raise rates. If that ever happens, pure panic in Wall Street. I mean, is it not a, not a blip, not a bump in terms of these inflation readings, Steve? Well, you know the old saying, uh, two points to draw a line, three points to draw a trend. Or there's the other saying, which is three strikes and you're out. I think we're kind of – we're there, but I don't think we're actually out. Let me just tell you what comes next uh, in the next um, – uh, uh, sort of story of inflation. We start tomorrow, guys, 
near term, we have the inflation action continues with the wholesale price report. That's supposed to be better behaved than consumer prices, believe it or not. Maybe you're skeptical, maybe you should be. All the closely watched indices there, you can see, are supposed to come down. That'll be good news. And that'll lead to a better forecast, or a more accurate forecast anyway, for the core PCE. That's the Fed's preferred inflation indicator. You can see that's been running about a percentage point better than the CPI has shown some increased improvement better than the CPI. We'll get that report at the end of the month. Now, futures markets remarkably kind of get into what Tim was talking about. They're clinging to the, this belief that the Fed's going to cut just further on down the road than before. Take a look at these uh, probabilities. Uh, as you guys reported, we got rid of the possibility almost of a June cut. That's 18 now or 20 compared to 58 before the number. Doubt about July, but what happened? Still 66 for September. So, hey, a post-Labor Day cut is now the bet rather than one just after Memorial Day. But who's thinking about vacation and days off? Not me. There's still some reason to forecast cuts besides just grasping at straws, but it's not going to happen unless inflation starts to decline consistently. What comes next? Well, rate cuts if inflation falls higher for longer if it doesn't. I just think, Melissa, the idea of a cut still out there. I've been right in forecasting a lot fewer cuts than the market has, but I still think, and I'll give you one very good reason. According to the Fed's own framework, even if they cut 25 or 50, they would still be restrictive. Yep. So they need the precondition sure. to cut, but they already have the reason. Okay. So three strikes were out. Three strikes is a trend. Um, and I'm just wondering, Steve, if, if a rate hike could be anywhere out there now. I don't, I don't think so. And, and, it, okay. and, and it sort of relates back to my last answer. Mm -hmm. the, the two options I believe on the table for the Fed, I could have this wrong, are holding at the current rate or cutting. The reason I don't have the hike in is because the Fed by its own measures or metrics is restrictive relative to where even inflation is at this higher rate. I think that's important to understand. The Fed is probably, I don't know how you want to measure it, a percentage of 150 basis points, 200 basis points restrictive. If it took 25 or 50 off the top, it would still be restrictive by that metric. What we do need is what Dan was talking about before. We need the economy to start acting in practice the way the Fed has constructed the economy to act in theory. Steve, it's Karen. Thanks for being on. Do you think that there is anything uh, holding the Fed back politically, let's say, from if they wanted to cut it sometime before the election? June's you know, off the table. I, I, look, I've been looking at these the, the data. The Fed seems to act when the Fed seems to feel it needs to act, according to most uh, calculations, and it's taken a bunch of heat for it. You remember the Bush, the first Bush administration in the 90s took some heat for that. There have been times it's cut during election season and not. I think Powell, all things being equal, would like to get it done well before the election or act after the election. Um, I just wonder, guys, when we look back at this, I'm, I'm fascinated by your perspective. Does a cut before, right after Labor Day going to matter that much if it comes rather than one that was right after Memorial Day. I don't think down the road it's going to matter all that much. <laughs> all right. Steve. So listen, if anybody thinks the Fed cutting rates 25 basis points or not cutting 25 basis points or even 50 basis points, let's say, for instance, is going to matter at all for the election, I got an ocean to sell you right behind my house. Okay? It's an ocean back there. It's not a mountain. It's an ocean. Because that's just ridiculous. That's not even like understanding of like economics 101. If... The Federal Reserve lowers rates 25, 50 base points. It means absolutely nothing for the election. I mean, 0%. If the Fed was to lower interest rates, you know, down to zero from, you know, 5.5% right now, down to zero rate for the election, that's a whole different story. But 0.25%, 0.5% is nothing. That's literally nothing. That's not going to even matter in the grand scheme of things, right? So, yeah, that, that's just like a ridiculous, like, belief out there. And, yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. That's like, like I said, not even understand economics 101. Thank you. Pleasure. Steve Leisman. Our next guest says equities have topped for the year. Damp Spring Advisors founder Andy Constant joins us now. Andy, great to have you with us. Does this mean that uh, we're going to see these rates go even higher, perhaps? Right. So I think, Melissa, that's the question, which is... I. 
equities will only respond, we will only get a tightening of financial conditions if rates do, in fact, go higher. You know, Steve just mentioned the framework around the Fed and its uh, claim that conditions are uh, tight in theory, are restrictive in theory. I think he's right. It's just not in practice. Um, so do, in fact, go. This is important, right? Uh, actually, I think it's one more before here. Be great to have you with us. Does this mean that uh, we're going to see these rates go even higher, perhaps? Right. So I think, Melissa, that's the question, which is I, equities will only respond. We will only get a tightening of financial conditions if rates do, in fact, go higher. You know, Steve just mentioned the framework around the. F so this is important. So obviously, August, September were rough for CPI relative, you know, for that particular time, 3.7, 3.7. And you obviously had a big kind of drop into the market into October, which we bottomed at. I can't remember the specific day we bottomed in October, but eventually we bottomed in October. And then we started the newest bull run that really ran through November, December, into January, February, right? And then since then, we've kind of laid off. So if you were to talk about, let's say another month comes in at like a 3.5, 3.6, and another month, we're going to have a probably a pretty big drop in the market there in the short term, right? Intel... The CPI trend gets better, and you could also get down to 3.1, 3.2, or under 3. That's the ideal. And then the, the market would come back. So right now, the market might give a little bit of the benefit of the doubt, but if you have another bad one, oof, that's when the market's going to go crazy. And, and it's, it turns uh, out bad, bad. Claim that conditions are uh, tight in theory, are restrictive in theory. I think he's right. It's just not in practice. Um, and that could be because the economy can handle higher rates. Um, which would mean that if it were not restrictive now, that inflation will stay higher for longer. And so I think until we wow. actually see it's some bearish. evidence of a restrictive Top economy, which would bearish. be widening credit spreads, falling equity prices, uh, widening risk premiums on assets, including term premiums on bonds, higher mortgage rates, the economy is going to still run very hot. And you can tell that um, not by looking at the very shortest uh, expectation of Fed cuts, but you look out to two years now. And over two years, only 107 basis points of total cuts are priced in. So they're not going to cut much for over for almost two years. And so that just tells you that the economy is strong and it'll take more for higher rates and mostly higher long term rates for the economy to turn over. Sounds like, though, then the Fed would have to reevaluate what it believes is restrictive and, and sort of re you know, configure that framework that Steve was talking about. Do you think that the Fed is getting it wrong right now? Well, I think they uh, do consider financial conditions, broad financial conditions in their framework. They focus and there's a, a my, my op myopic um, behavior that particularly we saw in Waller's speech in December around this very short term real Fed funds rate that Steve described. But they also have mentioned that when rates were at 5% uh, in October, that higher rates was, was doing some of the Fed's work for them, and they would not have to, have to cut because long-term rates were higher. Since then, they fell 110 basis points to the lows at the end of the year and are finally starting to climb back up. But at this point, they're not anywhere near as restrictive as they were in October. So <clears throat> I think they consider financial conditions, but they do have this myopic approach toward real Fed funds rate that seems to have backfired a bit. Hey, Andy, uh, it's Tim. So let, let's drill into this 10-year auction, and we spend time with you, and we should all be spending a lot of time focused on uh, this refunding cycle and the ones coming. But to oversimplify your answer, uh, what's causing higher yields? Is it the macro? Uh, is it that the buyers who you know typically have been more aggressive, and there's certainly been a secular trend that's been going on not just this year but for a couple of years, or is it purely the size of these auctions? What is the biggest ingredient to this move higher in rates? So I think three things, but certainly the rates started moving higher um, 
when the last QRA came out, which was on February 1st, you started to see a significant increase in, re- in long-term interest rates. And that was because the market um, was not prepared for $538 billion of new coupon issuance in Q2, nor were they prepared for the fact that it's likely to be $1.5 trillion of total supply of new coupon issuance between uh, the beginning of Q2, which we're in, through year end. So there's $1.5 trillion that has to get absorbed. That's certainly uh, impacting uh, bond yields right now. The other thing is that you're seeing rising inflation expectations, which are partly mechanical with increasing in um, oil prices, but also in other commodity prices, but also somewhat in expectations that the Fed has Um, um, paused a bit too long in dealing with inflation has let it get away from them a little bit. And you can see that in things like gold. Andy's Karen, thanks for being on. How does the sort of discussion around uh, reducing QT, slowing QT, how does that sort of fit into what Tim brought up on the other side? Right. So if they taper QT, which I fully expect them to do in the minutes today, they mentioned it. It may not be in the May meeting, but it's certainly likely to be in the June meeting. They do have some concerns about the uh, uneven uh, distribution of reserves amongst the banking system, which is a small part to be concerned about. Um, So I do expect them to taper. But once again, taper just means that they require less issuance from the U.S. Treasury to pay them back because, you know, as you know, they we do run off at the Fed in that they just let bonds mature. In this case, they'll reinvest some more of the proceeds from that that maturing and they've handed the monetary ball to the Treasury. So to the extent they taper, that reduces the amount of issuance the Treasury has to use. If they if the Treasury then decides to keep coupons still at this 500 billion net per quarter and just reduce bills, the taper won't be felt by the economy and it won't be felt by the markets. If they choose to reduce coupons and reduce the amount of supply of duration that the invest the investment community has to buy, Uh, then that would have an impact on taper. So I think by May 1st, when they do the next quarterly refunding announcement, we'll have an answer on how they're going. We may have an answer on how they Mm -hmm. plan on changing composition. You can tell when I'm outclassed on a subject because I just get real quiet and just listen and sit back. (laughs) I don't have anything to add when uh, when I'm outclassed on a subject. (laughs) Andy, always great to see you. Thank you. Andy Constant, Damp Spring. Guy? It's, it's a really interesting conversation in terms of what the higher yields mean for the broader market. That's what we're tasked to do, right? And maybe if it's a 4.5% where things start to get interesting again and the market's waking up to it today. But you know, I think Tim's question is to why are rates going higher? That hits the nail on the head. And they're going higher, I believe, for the wrong reasons. Issuance being one of them. It's a supply-demand thing. And not that we have to get into it now, but you're starting to see the ramifications in different currencies not least of which dollar-yen, which exploded today, the upside. The weakness in yen today was something that I'm telling you, over the next couple of weeks, the network will start talking about this in earnest. Well, that's intervention territory. Yeah, and and they, in fact, they were kind of at this place a month ago, and Mm -hmm. everybody knows what they need to do. And the irony is, of course, that what they need to do is is actually, you know, by getting away from YCC and and really, it, it should implicitly bring their currency up so... You know, in terms of the, the dollar amount down against the dollar. But I just look at where we are with rates. I, I would argue this has been a three-year move higher in rates. This hasn't just happened uh, overnight. There's been a lot of volatility within this. And during this three years, we've had a remarkable equity rally. At some point, um, you know, equity investors have to do the math on this. We, we just haven't done it. Um, and I, I, the question we're figuring out is, what's that sensitivity level on 10 years? Climbing up cars, real estate, and private investing. All right, guys, appreciate you joining me. Thanks so much for being here. As always, thanks for being subscribed. Thanks you for smashing that thumbs up. Also, pin comment down there. We are now four days and eight hours away from the big sale, folks. If you want access to that, and all, I can shoot you over the deal as soon as that drops on April 15th, a little over four days from now. Much love and have a great day.